Welcome back to another video. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. In today's video, I'll be talking to transfer guru and Spurs fan Ricky Sachs about the transfer activity for Tottenham so far in this transfer window. What else Tottenham need going forward? The players that are expected to leave Tottenham Hotspur Football Club before the 5th of October and all of the players that Tottenham are now being linked with. Ricky, thank you very much for joining me for this transfer talk. Now, Tottenham have done some business so far in this window. We have signed five players. I just want to get your opinion on the five players that Tottenham have signed so far. Um, of course, um, Tottenham signed Pierre-Emile Hoybier from Southampton. What do you make of this signing? Yeah, I, I still think, you know, we, we've got to give him some time. I think he played quite well at the weekend against Southampton. I think that was the first game where I come away feeling that actually I kind of know what this guy is, is here to do. I know he was brought in to predominantly try and, you know, provide some bite in that midfield. He was a bit of a terrier. That's what we hoped he would be. I think his first couple of games, I think he found it quite tough to settle in, if I'm being brutally honest with you. But having said that, I mean, I think I've come to the realisation that he's not a player that's going to give us a 10 out of 10 every single week. I think he's an unassuming character. I would say that, you know, Spurs... From what we've had in the past, you would like him to the likes of a Scott Parker, um, a Wilson Palacios, someone that's going to break up play. Won't be pretty. Um, it won't be glamorous on the eye, but he's there as a player to do a job. And I'm um, hopeful we're going to see more of him in these coming weeks. And there's no doubt about it. You know, Mourinho will continue to give him games as we're quite light in the area in which he's operating in terms of breaking up play for us. Ricky, obviously Pierre-Emil Hoybier comes with great Premier League experience with Southampton, but another player that Jose Mourinho brought in, Joe Hart, a free transfer from Burnley. You, were you pleased with that uh, signing for us? Well, I was, and then I saw the Watford game. But I know, again, it's, it's pre-season. I know, you, I know you can't you know, look too much into pre-season. I mean, it was a worry that the ball just went right through him. If I'm being brutally honest with you, is he going to get games? I mean, it'll be interesting to see in terms of where Mourinho selects him as and when. You know, obviously, we were meant to be playing Leighton Orient. And obviously, that at the moment looks like it's going to be either rearranged or obviously they're going to forfeit the game. So, and the question will be really when Joe Hart gets games. I mean, it's very clear that Hugo Lloris is the number one, and rightly so, because he's been magnificent since Project Restart. I think with Joe Hart, you know, bringing him in, he's a leader, very vocal, a player that has been used to winning. Um, not necessarily, obviously, in his most recent years at Burnley and Torino and West Ham, but I do think, you know, as someone at dressing room that will take responsibility and that will not be afraid to bark orders around, I do understand the transfer of Joe Hart more from a uh, coaching side of things rather than from a playing element. Ricky, at this point, um, Tottenham then went in to sign Matt Do Doherty from Wolverhampton Wanderers, a right back, you know, a position that we needed to improve on in the last season or so. Um, at this point, all of us Tottenham fans are thinking there is a pattern here. Jose Mourinho is clearly going out and getting players in with Premier League experience. What did you make of the signing of Matt Doherty? Yeah, I was delighted. I mean, the problem with, with, the, with, the, with the search for a left back and a right back is that it's not easy to find decent proven fullbacks coming from the Premier League. I think if you look at the players that are out there, I think you'd probably say that Ricardo Pereira was one that I know Spurs had their eye very, very, very close on before he went to Leicester City. I think probably he was, for me, the outstanding right back last season. So it's going to be very difficult to have lured a player of that capability away from Leicester. So having said that, Wolves are a decent Premier League side, as we've seen over the last couple of seasons. They've given us enough trouble. So I've got to be honest with you and say to you that I've, you know, I, it's, a, it's a good signing, though, I'd say. I don't think he's had the greatest start at Tottenham. That's not his fault. I think the formation isn't benefiting him at, benefiting him at the moment. I think once we do change the formation and we get Regulion in the team, I think that'll be a massive benefit to him. And, you know, you've got to remember something. Wolves to Tottenham, it's still a step up. You know, whether, you know, fans think that or not, I do think you have to take into account that Tottenham, no disrespect to Wolves, we're a bigger club than Wolves, you know, we're a club that, you know, operates in Europe every season, normally it's the Champions League, unfortunately this season it's the Europa League, but uh, I do think, you know, he's coming to a new club, new surroundings, being asked to play a different way, under Jose Mourinho, different players, I mean, give the guy time, he's shown no, you know, no concern of bombing forward, very unlucky not to score against Everton on the opening day, great little move, Harry Kane, so it's a real positive signing, and I'm honestly feeling that in time will be a great, great sign for Tottenham.
With players like Do- Doherty, have you been surprised that he's played all three competitive games so far this season? Because, um, you know, why is Serge Aurier not featured and, and why um, is, is he not sort of changing it around Jose Mourinho? Because a number of players, even Harry Kane involved in all of the, all of the games, where you'd have expected a squad rotation by now. Do you know what, Chris? I just think he doesn't trust the players that are there also to select. I don't think he trusts Aurea. Uh, I don't think he trusts the players that are on the bench. Like, you know, dare I say even like, Lamella, I mean, listen, he's got an affection for Lamella because he works very, very hard. But I think what you're seeing at the moment out on that pitch is the players that ultimately he feels can deliver him three points. That's the key here. And I think, again, you look at the squad he's got, and there's many players that we're going to come on to that, you know, there's a need to move players on. I think with Doherty, he is a player that Spurs looked at very, very close. Obviously, Mourinho admitted it and said that he'd never liked playing against him. I think for the signing and the money we got him for, it's a decent acquisition. But to answer your question, he does not trust those other players in that squad. Ricky, we then move on to two huge signings last week. And of course, every single Tottenham fan were on, was on a complete high. Sergio Regulon, uh, completely overshadowed by the signing of Gareth Bale. But what have you made of this signing from Real Madrid at left back? Yeah, do you know what? Um, I know it's a cliche to say it now because I know it seems a very unpopular opinion because um, I do feel that in time, Regulion will probably be the better signing of the two. Listen, I love Gareth Bale. I, I do love Gareth Bale. I think it will still be phenomenal for Tottenham, but um, Regulion's at an age where he can actually make that left-back spot his own for 10 to 15 years. I know it might sound absolutely crazy. Such a young, young kid. Um, you know, there's a real good opportunity there to really get the best out of him. And, you know, if anyone's watched this guy, so, so pacey, so quick. Uh, Spurs have been absolutely desperate, Chris, as obviously you've said on the last word on Spurs many, many times, that we want to get back to those days of having two really quick, swashbuckling fullbacks with Danny Rose and Carl Walker. I mean, my God, how we've really missed having two expansive fullbacks that love to get over the halfway line, love to push on. And, you know, Regulion will give us that opportunity. He absolutely loves to dominate play. Um, he's not afraid to shoot. He's got a great shot on him as well. And, you know, he was in the Liga team of the year. And I think him on the left, Doherty on the right. I mean, it just changes things up for Tottenham so much. And hopefully, I'm hoping that it will see us play a bit more of an expressive, expansive brand of football. I think we're destined to have that. We have to, you know, try and play with a bit more expression and just, you know, attack teams. We've got such great ability on the counter-attack that for Spurs generally, we have to use that to our armoury. We have to. I mean, you saw at the weekend, Son and Kane, that link-up play, and Dombele, the way he can transition play in the blink of an eye. So to answer your question, I think Regulion will be absolutely superb for Tottenham. I've got absolutely no doubt he'll settle. I know he's coming from the Liga. I think it's different for a striker than it is for a defender slightly. So, you know, a striker's expected to get goals. Um, defending first and foremost, you're there to stop them. And I've got absolutely no doubt that in time, let's give him some time, he'll be a, he'll be a very, very good signing for us. And of course, he won the Europa League last season as well. So not not only is yeah. Jose Mourinho bringing in players with Premier League experience, but he's now bringing in winners as well. Of course, I mean that's the thing. Listen, that you, me, and you have both been screaming out for. You know, we always keep saying trophies are coming. Um, obviously, yeah. these players have had the trophies. We just want them at Tottenham now. That's a difference. So, I think you know, really, really exciting player and. Long may it continue that we're bringing in these kind of players that have already got that winning mentality, won trophies, know how to win. I think that's the key with Tottenham. You know, we're bringing players in now that have not only just had experience, they've actually been there, done it and won it. Arguably haven't won Premier Leagues, but hopefully that will be coming at Tottenham. Ricky, we then come on to Tottenham's fifth uh, signing and most latest signing, Gareth Bale. The dream come true for every single Tottenham fan um, yeah. around the world. Now, what did you think when that news broke that, uh, you know, from Jonathan Barnett, his uh, agent actually said that Tottenham was the only place that he wanted to be? Could you believe the news? No, I mean, it gives you a lovely warm feeling, doesn't it? I mean, a player that we always adored. And I mean, admittedly, I said this on another show that when he left Tottenham, I, I felt it was a year too soon for him. I honestly felt he could have given us one more year. And I mean, regardless of what Real Madrid think of him, whatever, you know, wh- whatever's happened at that football club, you know, the guy won four Champions League. I think he won four trophies. Uh, sorry, he won 14 trophies in total, four Champions Leagues. You know, you don't win that. You don't win those kind of calibre of trophies if you're a bad player. So I feel the way he's been treated by Madrid fans is completely wrong. And I think we're lucky by the fact of how bad his experience has been at Madrid that he wanted to come to a club that absolutely adores him and loves him. Hence the reason why Tottenham was his preferred destination. It was only ever going to be Tottenham. There was interest for Manchester United, as we know. 
but you know it was always going to be Spurs and I think the key now for us and for Gareth is really to try and work on that fitness obviously we put on a very much um, regimented schedule to get him back in fit we want to see him back early of course we do I mean I know the extra me is meant to be to, meant to be four weeks but I'm confident we've seen Kane come back early before from injury we've seen Deli Ali come back Hummin Min Son Lucas Mora you know, doesn't need reminding how many injuries we had last season. You know, our medical staff are quite well trained in terms of trying to do their best to get players back. So I'm hoping for Gareth's sake and for Tottenham's sake, it isn't long. And I fully expect as well, I mean, whilst it's a loan move, um, providing it all goes well, there's no reason that Gareth can't finish his career at Tottenham. There really isn't. As long as the club's going the right way and obviously Gareth's career's going the right way, I mean, fingers crossed he's here for many, many years to come. Absolutely. Ricky, where do you think that Gareth Bale is actually going to fit in um, on the pitch? You know, who, who's going to make way for him and, and what position will he be playing in? It's a great question. I think Spurs are set up predominantly probably go to go to 3-4-3. Three, three. Um, I think, you know, it's a real, real tricky one. Um, I don't want to bring on, come on to it now because you're going to probably ask me later in the show, but I probably see, you know, Deli Ali being the player that's going to have to make way for Gareth's position in the team full time. I know Deli's not been in the team recently. But obviously, Delhi was in the team majority of last season. So I do see Gareth coming in the team. Um, because of Spurs switching the formation, I would probably say you'd have probably Kane up top, Bow on the left, and then Bow on the right. Or you can alternate those guys on. I think Eva can switch. I mean, it's quite a, a formidable three when you think about it. I mean, you look at the goals at the weekend, you think you've got Gareth Bow to add to that. I mean, my God. Um, Amazing. You end up thinking to yourself, how can we not win a league with this, with that, for that attack? I mean, if only the defence was that great. Um, that's, the, that's the biggest problem. We're going to come on to that. I know we are. But, I mean, for me, you know, when that attack is at its best, when you saw Kane and Son at the weekend, I mean, you had Gareth Bale to that, Gareth Bale that's on form, a Gareth Bale that's in the top 10 players in the world. I mean, I would arguably say I'd still pick our attack over Liverpool. So, I know a lot of Liverpool fans won't be happy by me saying that. But, I, listen, for, for me, Neo Salamane, that's a great free. But, I mean... Gareth Bale on form, Hummin Son, Harry Kane. I mean, my God. I mean, wouldn't you pick that free? Are you very hard to not pick that it's free? Amazing. You? Yeah. It's amazing. But um, think about it, Rick, of uh, the, the changing room now being transformed into winners yeah. and leaders oh, and, and, and players who have been there and done it. And of yeah. course, uh, Ledley King is now in the coaching staff as well. Jose Mourinho has gone out there. You know, he's won every trophy in the, in, the, in the land. So, you know, he is now really getting in a lot of the experience and a lot of leaders and winners, isn't he? Oh, he is. Yeah, no, he has. And I mean, listen, credit to Mourinho. I think obviously at the moment fans are kind of subjective to the style of football, should I say. I know it's not been the greatest on the eye. Um, but I don't think anyone can argue with the kind of calibre of players that he's looking to bring in. I think one of my... When I go back and have a look at the times in the past, I think one of my, I'd say pet hates or one of my frustrations was that Pochettino, it's well documented, he was offered players during his time uh, with Daniel Levy in that period where we didn't buy anyone for, you know, two consecutive transfer windows. And I'm not saying that, you know, Pochettino was back to the, to the core and he got everything he wanted. But I think, you know, to be fair to Mourinho, he's not one to turn down an option. And, you know, Daniel Levy made it very clear that Bale was a present. And I think, you know, Pochettino was offered plenty of presents by Daniel Levy that he didn't want to accept. I think Mourinho's got the capability and the ego to handle these big-time players. And I've got absolutely no doubt that providing we change our style of football a little bit, we have to change it a little bit to suit the likes of Gareth Bale, Doherty, Regulion. We've got a wonderful team to look forward to. We should be very, very excited as Tottenham fans. We really should be. The trophies are coming then, Rick, yeah? The trophies have to be coming. I mean, God, uh, you know, I've said this to you before, Chris. I mean, if they don't happen with Gareth Bale in the team, Harry Kane, Hummin Son, Ndombele in midfield, Doherty, at, you know, right back, left back, you've now got Regulion, Lloris in goal, World Cup winner, Toby out of I mean, if we can't win trophies yeah. with this team, Jose Munoz won 26 trophies, won a trophy at every club he's been at, apart from Tottenham yet. It is his first full season. If we can't win it with him and this squad, then quite frankly... I don't know where we go. I don't know where we go. So we have to believe it's going to happen because if we don't, then um, I don't know Absolutely. what we do. Absolutely, we believe. Now, oh. Ricky, um, we needed a CDM. We went out and got one in Pierre and Hoybier. We needed a right back. We went out and got one in Matt Doherty. Uh, needed a left back. Jose Mourinho went to Real Madrid and got one. Needed a playmaker. Gareth Bale has now come in. We know that we need a striker. We have known this for a very, very long time that we need either a backup striker or a striker to play with Harry Kane. Um, apart from the striker, what else do we need? Yeah, I think, again, I it probably comes across really greedy because we're in a transfer window where I don't think as Spurs fans, we ever go into a transfer window 
and then ever come out of it actually getting everybody that we actually need. I always feel that when we go into a transfer window, there's three or four positions that we clearly need. We end up coming out with one or two and then players that are overstocked in the area that we already had. So, for example, Steven Bergvine, look, I think he's a great signing. I think giving time will be brilliant. But did we need him last, last January? No, we didn't. We needed a striker. We didn't get a striker. We wouldn't have got another winger. You know, that's been the frustration of Tottenham fans, that we haven't always gone and actually got the player we needed in a specific area. So, to answer your question, who, what do we need? I, for me, I still think we need another central attacking midfielder. I've got reservations over Lo Celso's position, not reservations over him as a player. I think he's a great player. But whether it's his choice or not, he's playing a much more withdrawn role to what we need a player to be in that central attacking midfield area. That's a big concern for me, that Ndombele could become that player, but he's not playing him there. So whether in time Ndombele will move forward and that will solve that issue, then OK, that might happen. But the way I'm looking at the moment is that if it wasn't for that one bit of magic in that first half against Southampton, that purette from Ndombele, that game was only going one way, Chris. It was only going one way. And we were very lucky that Southampton played a, such a suicidal high press against us and they maintained it the whole game. So to answer your question, we need a central attacking midfielder. I look at our defence and I'm terrified. Terrified. I mean, I'm absolutely terrified seeing our centre-backs. All of them. <laughs> that might sound over the top, but I promise you it isn't. Because since Toby Adevaro signed his new deal, I love Toby, but he's lost a yard of pace. Sanchez, for all of his good stuff about him, for me, he needs a plan next to him to guide him the whole 90 minutes. He needs more of an experienced head. He's got a mistake in him. Eric Dyer wants to be a centre-back, but he's not good enough to be a centre-back. That's our problems. One fourth, can't get anywhere near the team. Jaffet Tanganga, I like Jaffet. He's very, very young, very, very raw. Every time I've seen him, I've been impressed, but he probably again needs an older head around him. So it's whether we can marry together a partnership of, you know, Tanganga with one extra, for me, mature centre-back that's been there and done it. And this might sound really harsh now to Vireld, but I mean, that Everton game where there was that challenge that came up and he got absolutely nowhere near the ball. I am massively worried about our centre-back options. And it's all great, you know, having a great forward line of Gareth Bale, who means on Harry Kane. That's amazing. But we can't outscore teams every week. So to answer the question, uh, we definitely need a centre-back, if not two. We need a central attacking midfielder and we need a striker. So that's what, that's five. I mean, that'd be five players for me. Um, are we going to get five players? No, we're not. We're not going to get five, four or five players. So if we can get a, if we can get a centre back and we get a striker, then you'd probably say it's been a, you know a decent window. Rick, talking about the likes of Wan Foy, um, do do you expect him to leave? Well, I think the problem we've got at Tottenham is that a lot of players are happy just to pick up their money, and that's I don't mean that disrespectfully to players or being rude, but you know you're playing at the or you're, you're, you, are, you are around the club with the best stadium in the world. You are around with the club at the best training ground in the world. You are in London. Therefore, the problem you've got is that a lot of these players are quite content with their life and they don't desperately need to play. And I'm not for one second sitting here saying that, you know, these players are just taking the money, although it comes across like that. But what I'm insinuating is that it is sometimes very, very hard to do a deal unless you've got two clubs that, number one, are willing to sell and number two, are willing to buy. And the problem with Tottenham they've got at the moment is that there's a number of players there that aren't too concerned if they do get game time or if they don't get game time. And, you know, as we know with Tottenham, our premium has always been the same. We buy for the lowest possible price and we sell for the possible highest price. So that's always been the case at Tottenham under this current board. And I'm not critic uh, well, am I criticising the board? I I'm criticising the board to some degree because it doesn't always benefit us. But from a business perspective, fantastic. It's great if you can do that and get away with it. But we can't always get away with it. So we are going to have to compromise. We are going to have to find a way. I mean, listen, they've got Gareth Bale back at the club, which I think no matter, you know, if you are, you know, Levy in, Levy out, Enoch in, Enoch out, I think you have to give the board a massive amount of credit to bring Gareth Bale to the club under these current circumstances with the COVID situation, with our financial situation. I think you have to give the club a lot of credit for making that move and backing Jose Mourinho. At the same time, you know, am I going to be angry at the club they don't get one fourth out? I'm not going to be that massively concerned. Am I going to be concerned if Gazaniga doesn't leave? I'm not going to be massively concerned. Uh, the players might care, but at the end of the day, you know, 
they'll still be here unless they can find a move. And that's the same for Danny Rose in that category as well. Danny, as we know, Danny was in talks with Genoa. Um, they weren't prepared to meet Danny's salary demands. Um, Danny obviously feels that he's at the level of, it, of Inter Milan or AC Milan. Um, I think we know he's nowhere near that level. Um, he might have to start looking, you know, maybe this side of the pond in more of the championship clubs. That's no disrespect to Danny. Um, well, that comes across very disrespectful to Danny that he wants to go from AC Milan to maybe Charlton or to, you know, to, <laughs> to Middlesbrough. Uh, but it's going to have to well, be realistic. Well, Rick, him and Cameron Carter-Vickers are two players that haven't even been given a squad number in this Tottenham no. squad. You'd imagine them to go, wouldn't you? You'd have to imagine them to go. Um, again, it's, it's all down to, like I say, the players' preference to where they want to go. I mean, Cameron Carter-Vickers, I've already, I feel quite sorry for him. You know, every time he comes back to Tottenham, he's got a different manager to come under for a pre-season. He's had AVB, um, he's had Pochettino, he's now had Mourinho. I mean, the poor bloke, I think he's had less games than he's had managers. So, it, it is quite crazy. What do you make of the situation with Serge Aurier? Are Tottenham selling him before the 5th of October? Is he staying? Do we need two right-backs? You know, we've always had two right-backs. We've always needed that strength and depth and we've always needed that um, squad rotation. Um, mm. We always thought that um, Serge Aurier would be going on because it's been widely, um, you know, put out in the media that, yeah. you know, we've got to get the money in to, to go and spend. So do you think he's going to stay or do you think he's going? Well, there's significant interest from Spartak Moscow in him at the moment. Whether that goes any further than just an inquiry remains to be seen. I think with the issue we've got with Aurea is that he obviously, at the moment, wage demands is quite high. His fee, Daniel Levy, from again, from understanding just certain things that are going on, you know, Daniel is not willing to take a penny less than what we bought him for two or three years ago, which is quite concerning and quite hard if you watch a highlights package of Aurea over the last 24 months. Um, you know, I think generally... We are going to have to compromise. And this is what I mean about Daniel. Listen, you know, from a business perspective, it's great mentor, it's great attitude. Great, fantastic to go into that, you know, into, into negotiating, believing that you will be able to get the maximum for a player. But at the same time, I think you have to also take into account that, you know, you look at his form. I don't think he wants to be at Tottenham. I don't think he wants to be at Tottenham last year. He came out and said himself he wants to go. But again, I mean, what we're doing here, Chris, if we're selling Aurea, we are weakening our squad. No matter how poor you think Aurea is, if Doherty goes and injures himself tomorrow, we're without a recognised right-back to some degree. Tanganga can play there. But again, Tanganga, it's putting square pegs in round holes. So, I don't know. I, I, if you ask me to predict will Aurea be here or not, you'd say at the moment there's a good chance he will be because no one's willing to pay the money. But again... As we get down to transfer deadline day, I think there'll be a keenness from Tottenham to make sure that the players Munio are working with are the players that want to be there. I think he's made that very clear in his um, post-match press conference after the game at the weekend that his squad is fully overstocked. And therefore, he only really likes to work with a group, kind of 18 to 20 players, very similar to Pochettino. If you remember, Pochettino never liked to have a massive group of players, so you keep it fresh all the time. The players feel they're getting regular games. So, yeah, I mean, I'd be... As things stand on Aurea, as I said to you, I, I, don't, I really don't know. He could, he could stay, he could go. Very difficult to know until the last week of the window. A lot will pick up in the last week, I'm sure. Ricky, one, uh, one rumour that is concerning a lot of Tottenham fans right now, including me and you, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, um, is Deli Alli. Yeah. Um, even Fabrizio Romano has come out and said that Deli Alli is being offered out uh, to European clubs such as Paris Saint-Germain. Would you be sorry to see him go? I would. I would. I mean, listen, firstly, I've got to say on Delhi, his first couple of years in a Tottenham shirt were absolutely phenomenal. I mean, they really, really were. I've got to say, as a player, um, and I think I've, I've enjoyed watching anybody rise as much as he did in those first couple of years. It was wonderful to see a player come in from League One, take the Premier League by storm, play fearlessly and just whip up the whole league. The stats were unreal. Listen, I think more goals, Premier League assists combined than the likes of Gerrard, Beckham, Lampard. Um, just a, a wonderful, wonderful player. And, you know, it's... I don't know what's happened to Delhi over these last 24 months. I can't quite put my finger on it. Is it something from the outside? Is you know, I know he's got his hot his interest from the outside in terms of his other businesses going on. But I don't know, Chris. I mean, listen, we were very lucky to obviously collaborate with Amazon. We had the early access footage with Amazon and stuff. And when we watched the documentary, I think all of us first before it went out publicly, I think all of us were concerned by the way in which Mourinho seemed to be targeting him for me. And again, listen, life is a Life is one of those things where, you know, criticism and the way it's perceived in life is, is, is an interesting trait because 
I am not that comfortable with public criticism in front of groups. I don't like that. I would prefer that you take a player to a side if you've got a problem with how he's performing and you yeah. don't do it in a group. I know everyone's different. And the reality is, I'm talking about a manager here that's won 26 trophies. So who am I to sit here and try and critique his management style? He knows what he's doing. He's won all the trophies in the land. Um, his management style isn't for everyone because we've seen him lose out on the likes of Salah, De Bruyne that have left him and have gone on to have fabulous careers. And I'm talking to you in the midst of this where Ndombele seems to be picking up some form. I, mean, I know he's only doing 45 minutes before Jason rounds it down my neck. I know he's only doing 45 minutes at the moment, but the player seems to have given Mourinho a reaction there with Ndombele. With Deli Ali, I think the issue we've got is that it seems widely known now that he was offered to Madrid with that bail deal. So when that comes out publicly like that, imagine you're Deli Ali. How do you feel? You've mm. just been offered to another club. How does that make you feel if that's the club that you know you're playing for and they're actively trying to move you on? Yeah. I I with with, with me for Ali. I mean, he frustrates me so much. But he's a player that you don't want to take off because you know there's a moment of brilliance in him. But the problem is you have no idea when it's coming or if it will come. So I will be gutted to see Ali go because on the one word potential. But I've been waiting on this next rise of his potential for the last 24 months and it hasn't happened. So my other reservation is that we're letting Gareth Bale come in the team at 31, 32 on a season on loan. We're letting Ali go out at 24, maybe on a, if, it's a permanent, if it's a permanent move. I mean, we're losing Ali's core years here. And with Gareth, you know, don't get me wrong, listen, I want Gareth Bale at the club. I'm not saying I don't want him. But why can't we have both? What, this is what I don't quite understand. Why can't we have both? Why have we got to sacrifice one or the other? And I know what I said earlier is that maybe you can't get them into the same team. This manager is paid the third highest salary, I think, in the world or in the UK. Find a way. Find a way of keeping these best players together. Find a way. Well, it's weird, Rick, because we talk about trophies all the time. You know, we haven't yeah. won a, a League Cup since 2008, and that was our last trophy. You know, I'm going to get that line in again. Um, and when you think that, you know, we, we should have been playing Leighton Orient tonight in the League Cup. Yeah. When you think that how many games in the League Cup that, w that we could play if we went to the final. Yeah. The Europa League as well. Premier League games coming in thick and fast. You know, yeah. we want to progress in the FA Cup and want to try and win that. Jose Mourinho clearly wants to win trophies at Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. So we need the depth. And even Alan Sugar, um, you know, yeah, joked yeah. on, on Twitter all, all, the other day, yeah. saying about, yeah. I've got too many players. You know, Jose Mourinho last year didn't have enough players and now he's got suddenly too many. Yeah, very strange. I mean, you're never going to satisfy everything with him. He's never going to be completely happy. You know, it's funny because I think the worst thing he ever done was when he came in the door at Tottenham, he said, I've got a good squad here. I don't think he knew the problems behind the scenes of it. You know, to say it's a good squad was, I found it baffling at the time. Maybe he was just trying to dress it up because it wasn't a good squad. It was a squad full of fragmented players that had been broken down the years because of not winning trophies and had, that had had false promises over wage demands that never really came off. What do I see happen over Deli Alley? Is probably the answer to your question. Honestly, as things stand, it seems like Daniel is adamant that he doesn't really want to sell Ali, but Mourinho seems to be evident that he's not part of his first team plans. Now, I think the key will be that we both know that Mourinho is not here for the long term. Mourinho won't be here in five years' time. Ali is 24 years old. So yeah. what might suit all parties is just to give him a season-long loan and then let's analyse the situation come next season because who knows if Mourinho will be here after that that's not me saying I want him to go or I want him to stay I'm just saying that Jose Mourinho is a short-term solution he's here to win trophies again if we don't win anything this season and the football is not of a great magnitude there'll be massive pressure on Jose Mourinho with or without Gareth Bale with or without Sir, you know Regulon with or without Doherty with or without Hoybier with or yeah. without Deli Ali, there'll be pressure. So all I'm saying is I think what would suit all parties at the moment, and it seems like we're going that way, is that, look, give Deli a season on loan. Let him go and play his football. Fingers crossed for his sake, he gets himself back into form and back into the squad for the Euros. Um, because I really like the kid. I really like the kid. And I found it very hard to watch some parts of that Amazon documentary. And I know some people might think, oh, you're sentimental. You know, you're, you're taking it too much to heart. 
criticism, you know, I've got no problem at all with criticism if it's positive criticism or, what, or if it's negative. I think there's a way that you go about doing it. And I question whether sometimes the way Maria went about it was the right way. But I've got to say, just on a whole, that documentary, he came across inspiring. I will say that he was inspiring to watch. Um, definitely episodes one to six. I pretty questioned the last few. But one to six, I thought he was absolutely magnificent. And me personally, I'd run through big rules for the guy. Well, episode seven, eight, and nine turned into the Ricky Sack show, didn't it? Oh, those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, bless God. No, lovely, lovely, to be, lovely to be part of it. Lovely to be part of it. It was. It yeah, was. It was Ricky, let's get let's get on to transfer rumours yeah. now. Yeah. You are tweeting twenty four hours a day about who Tottenham are possibly <laughs> signing, who Tottenham you know are going to sign next. Um, what is the latest? What is the news? Yeah, well, I think um, let's do striker first. I think strikers, you know, the area that we both agree pressingly we need. I think uh, links from what we're telling over the last couple of days, um, Spurs have been heavily now linked again to Milik of Napoli. Um, he's got a total of 48 goals in 121 games for Napoli. Good striker. Uh, you probably want to say nearly six foot. Good aerial ability. Great finisher. Again, your reservation will be not Premier League proven. I think, you know, Napoli are looking to sell the striker. There's clearly interest from Tottenham. It's not been the first window in which they've tried to get him. Um, I think the next week will prove definitive as to whether Tottenham can get him. There has been interest in the past from the likes of Roma, who've been keen. Couldn't agree a deal there. I know Juventus are sniffing around as well. So it's one to keep an eye on. I think he's a good level player. Uh, I think, you know, he's got all the ability to come in and, you know, really add to Tottenham's dimension of attack. But, I mean, I'm sitting here saying that. I keep thinking... You know, if Gareth Bale, Hummin Son, and um, obviously, of course, Hummin Son, Harry Kane, Gareth Bale, we keep them fit. You know, that striker wants to sit on the touchline. So, again, I've always been of the adamant thing for me that Spurs don't need a backup striker. They need a striker to compete with Harry Kane. But that yeah. striker's got to be coming in and willing to really try and, you know, try and break that mould of what will be that front three of Bale, Son, and Kane, I still can't believe I'm saying this, Chris. I keep saying Bale, Son, and Kane. I still have to keep Ricky, going, myself. going back to Milik of Napoli. Yep. Um, yep. All, all of the reports that I keep reading is that you know they want they want too much money. Tottenham are not willing to pay the money. Is that is that true? I would say at the moment that um, they can find a compromise on that because Napoli are desperate to sell him. Tottenham is a striker, and as the window ticks down in that last week. I think there's a deal to be done there if Tottenham haven't moved for another striker, but we've been in with a lot of names and potentially there's some other strikers out already further down the line than Milikar. But in the last 24 hours, when you see this video go out, um, Spurs are moving and accelerating quickly for him. I know they're meant to be apparently meeting with his agents tomorrow, representatives of the player. So there's every chance that a deal could be done there fairly quickly. But Spurs are going to have to move on this. And I keep saying that, you know, these strikers, they don't wait around. You know, if he has a better deal from elsewhere in terms of wage demands, a signing on fee, um, he will go. And we know what Tottenham are like, you know, I think widely reported. Um, the likes of Callum Wilson. Callum was up for joining Tottenham. We dilly-dallied. We waited. Didn't get him. And there's been other strikers as well this window that we haven't gone for. That for whatever reason, it's not been the fee. You know, we haven't matched the players' wage demands. You know, Ezzy's a player that at QPR... We looked at for so, so long. We looked at this player for years. Went to Palace. I mean, listen, don't get me wrong. He could go on to be a world superstar. He might not do. But the point of the matter is Tottenham, you know, we scout so many players. And it's true that, you know, you see a lot of these names being linked. Yes, yeah, Spurs have scouted them. We can't sign everyone. You know, if we signed everyone, no. we'd have a squad of 150 players. So, yeah. you know, the reality is that we're linked with a lot of players. We have looked at these players. But whether we move for them or not is another question. We inquire for loads of players over a summer. Milik is one of those names. Ricky, one of the ones, uh, one of the rumours that worried me yesterday is Ben Teke of Crystal Palace. Oh, now, of course, at the start of the video, we were talking about, um, you know, Jose Mourinho bringing in players of good Premier League experience. You couldn't argue with Ben Teke's Premier League experience, but is he really the right person to bring to Tottenham? I mean, my God, it depends what our ambitions are, doesn't it? If we're, if we're looking for a top 10 finish with an aim at the Carabao Cup, then... Uh... We found our man, but we all want more than that. I mean, I can't quite believe we're a club that a week ago are bringing in a player with the top 10 players in the world in Gareth Bale. And we're, if we're sitting there brokering a deal for Ben Teke, I mean, my God, talk about, you know, the complete polar opposites, the rise and fall of Tottenham Football Club, Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, should I add. I really hope not to answer the question. I really hope not. It's not one that I've heard that's been linked from a very, very strong source. So Tottenham fans wouldn't worry too much at the moment. Ricky, what do you make of the um, the approach for Danny Ings? 
I think Danny is a wonderful player. We saw at the weekend what a great goal he scored. You question our defender let him score the goal, of course, but a great player. I don't think Southampton will sell in this window. I think, obviously, bear in mind, they've already sold us Hoybier and our relationship with Southampton, let's be honest about it, isn't the greatest. We nabbed Toby Alderweireld from them when they were negotiating to try and buy him. We've had Pochettino off them. We've had Glenn Hoddle. We've had Dean Richards. I can go further on this. You know, there's been so many players that Tottenham have taken from Southampton. They're almost becoming a feeder club to us. No offence to them. Um, I don't see the, in a way in which Spurs can get Danny Ings this window. I think it's one they can revisit in the summer, but it depends, again, the level of quality striker Spurs bring in this window. Spurs will definitely sign a striker this window, 100%. Depending on that level of quality, would then kind of, again, relate to if Danny Ings is a target in future windows. Yeah, in the last couple of days on this channel, I've put a few videos out about Jesse Lingard and the comments have been so negative, saying, Jesse Lingard, no way. What is it with Jesse Lingard that people just don't like? Well, I just think, again, he's a player that, you know, lives off that word potential. We're still waiting. I think we're four years down the line. We haven't seen it. That We have not seen the potential. This is the problem with, with you know, Jesse Lingard. Um, broken into the England squad. Had a good year or two. Never went, never really went and fulfilled his, his potential. You'd probably argue, again, similar to Deli Alley. First couple of years was great. But oh, t I tell you, I've I really re got reservations. If we're allowing Deli Alley to leave this club and we're bringing Jesse Lingard in, I do question, you know, at what level these decisions are being made. Because, um... Jose Mourinho, listen, I'm not one to question a man that's on 26 trophies, I've already said on this show. But, I mean, you've got to ask yourself, if we're swapping Deli Alley for Jesse Lingard, I want to question the logic behind that. What, who, is, <laughs> who thinks that is a right decision to make? I, I can't quite get it. I mean, unless Deli desperately wants a way. I mean, from what I can gauge, Ali loves Tottenham. You know, Ali wants to be here. But, again, with Ali, it's dependent on first-team football. And Jesse Lingard, I mean, again, as Tottenham as a football club, Although he's a Man United player, I'd like to think we've got a bit more ambition. Ricky, Luis Suarez, Barcelona, could be leaving on a free transfer. Um, could Tottenham go out and, oh. and get someone like him? Oh, what a player. I mean, look at, you look at his stats, career stats, 745 games, 470 goals, 18 trophies, Uruguay's leading goal scorer of all time. What a great player. What a great player. I would love Tottenham to go for Luis Suarez. I mean, he ticks so many boxes. Premier League proven, knows where the back of the net is, performs in every country that he's played in. Um, he's still at a decent age. We can get a couple more years out of him. Um, there's been, again, reports that Barcelona might even terminate his contract, which would then mean, that, say, as you say, a free agent. I mean, he sounds like the absolute dream. I don't know, with Suarez, how keen he would be to come and have to play second fiddle and sit on the bench. Not saying he would, but I'm thinking that how do you fit him into a team with Kane... Bale, Son, and you add Suarez to that, that's four strikers on the field. I don't see how we can play the four of them. Maybe against the bottom half side, you could get away with it, but I don't see how we could have every single one of those players on the field. So I think Suarez is a dream player. I think he'd have to be willing to compromise on his game time and we'd have to, play him, we'd have to pay him a quite decent amount of money to come here to sit on that bench. But then again, I look at Chelsea, Arsenal, Liverpool, Man United. They play players a lot of money to sit on the bench, so why can't we? Ricky, one question for you. If if Tottenham signed a really, really decent striker like Luis Suarez, um, you know, I think it's quite unrealistic that that will happen. But if they did, will Jose Mourinho change his formation? Will we play two up front? Well, I think he'll change his formation now, Chris, because of the fullbacks. I think he's going to change him anyway now. Uh, two up front, I mean... I feel like everyone says two up front. It's going back to Harry Redknapp days, old school Harry. You know, two that two strikers up front. I mean, it's it's doable. It's, of course, it's doable. I mean, there's there's certain teams you can do it against. I mean, no offence. You know, we've got the likes of. I mean, I say Leeds, but Leeds are, <laughs> look really good this season. Leeds look really good. I mean, the yeah. likes of West, likes of West Brom. You maybe argue you'd have two strikers. I mean, I think the argument Spurs would say is that they already play with more than one striker because you know. Son, I mean, Son is an attacker. Listen, Son isn't a striker. I'm not sitting there saying Son is a striker, but he plays that further forward that he almost becomes a second forward, if that makes sense. Um, he's an attacker, Hummin Son. He's not a striker. I mean, let me make that clear. Spurs do need to go out and sign a striker this window. To answer your question, there's actually no reason why Tottenham can't play 4 4 2 with Gareth Bale and Harry Kane up top, or Harry Kane and Hummin Son, or Bale and Son. Absolutely no reason why they can't. I think the formation is subject to change anyway once Raguli on his fit and we have those two fullbacks in our team. And we become a bit more expansive, we hope. Lastly, Rick, Kim Min Jay. Is it going to happen? Uh, Kim Min Jay, is it going to happen? I mean, again, from what I understand, Spurs are going to probably be looking to do that one later in the window if it does happen. Uh, 
Lazio were interested. They've called their interest in the player for the moment. That can always change. I think we have to make this point that on transfers, it changes day to day, hour to hour, second to second. You know, whatever happens on this call now, the complete opposite can happen in the space of a minute. That's the way transfers work. You know, we have to understand that. Joe Hart's deal happened in a matter of hours. You know, the Gareth yeah. Bale deal. If we, I think, Chris, we spoke quite a while back about Gareth Bale. And we, I think both of us never could see that happening. Again, yeah. certain things have to fall into place to make that deal happen. Both clubs have to be willing to sell. The player has to want to move. The finances have to be right. To transfers, there's a lot of things that have to be in place to make a transfer happen. To answer the question on Kim Min Jae, I think it's one that can potentially happen. Um, I want to say that Spurs have got a huge interest as well in Ruben Diaz. So, um, whilst Kim Min Jae has been a long-time target this particular window, and Hun Min Son knows him really well, and apparently Son has been in his ear trying to persuade him to come to Tottenham, I don't think the player needs much persuasion. I think the issue that we've always had is that the fee has been the problem. Tottenham haven't been willing to pay um, Beijing, I think, between 15 to 20 million euros to get him. I think Spurs feel that fee is too expensive. So... The question will be towards the end of this window, as it always is with Tottenham, will that fee come down and will Daniel Levy work his magic the same way with Gareth Bale? I think the wages, um, Daniel went in at, I think, he originally wanted, he originally was going to go in at, I think, 20% to pay Gareth 20%. And I think they settled on 37%, which isn't bad, is it, to be fair on Gareth Bale? So I think that tells you Spurs' mentality in a transfer window in negotiating, that they'll go in always very, very low. And towards the end of the window, with a week to go, I think it won't concern Tottenham. They haven't got the centre-back sorted yet. But it concerns me watching this team every week without a couple of centre-backs, I'll be honest with you. So Ruben Diaz and Kim Min Jae, those are the two centre-backs to watch out for. It's gone very quiet on Milan's Skrinra now. Um, I think only purely down to the reason that Ndombele seems to be back in Mourinho's plans and therefore that swap deal that was on the table with Inter Milan seems to no longer be there. So... Unless Spurs are going to be able to buy Milan's screen right outright, which I don't see a possibility because I think his release clause is very, very hefty. I think that one is a is not a go anymore. I think it could be between Kim Min Jae or, as I say, you know, Ruben Diaz. But don't be surprised again. It's the transfer window. Players come up all the time. Spurs are being offered players by agents all the time. It could be a completely different name that comes up. Ricky, um, without um, talking about Milik. Any other um, strikers being linked with the club? Yeah, just a couple. I mean, I will give them a shout. Um, I mean, Sorloff looks like he's about to complete his move, or he already has, probably by the time this video goes out, it's already happened. He's completed his move to RB Leipzig. He signed a five-year contract worth €22 million. Euros. So there was interest from Tottenham. I think, again, once they heard the fee, um, we absolutely went running away from it, uh, which is <laughs> probably no surprise. Uh, another name I have to mention is... I don't want to butcher this because it's a quite a difficult name, German name, uh, Val Weghorst, German Peter Crouch guy, really, very similar to him, six foot six, and he's averaged a goal or assist every game, I think, over 144.3 minutes in the Bundesliga last season. 16 goals, three assists, not a bad return. And like I say, he's very much likened to Peter Crouch, very, very tall, good with his feet, can finish. Again, the concern you've got, same as Milik, coming in from a different league, can he hit the ground running? Uh, a couple more names to mention, Habib Diallo. So Diallo fits the, the profile of what Tottenham are looking for. Um, he's a strong character, resilient guy. Um, his record with Mets last season scored 12 goals in a team that, you know, I think player-wise, he was in a team that really, I mean, uh, I think uh, like a relegated side. They weren't a great side at all. So he's a player that's in a really, really poor team. and um, One that, you know, arguably you'd say with better players around him, he could be a good player. But again, I have to keep emphasising this point. If you're going to buy foreign, the problem you've got is that they don't know the English league. How quickly are these guys going to hit the ground running? So that's one more there. Um, Carlos Vinius um, finished the Premier League Liga top scorer with 18 goals and five assists in 32 games last season, averaging a goal or assist every 78 minutes. Looks like a good little striker. The older on YouTube, to be fair. I mean, guys, when you listen to this, you don't need to tell me. You can go and Google these players to have a look at them. As Danny Rose used to do on a Tottenham transfer window. He's, again, a, a player that Spurs have got an interest in. Will it happen? He's one of many, many strikers linked. Um, who else have we got? Midfielder-wise, I mean, they, they did like an interest in Federico Benedeschi. And uh, who else have we got? Douglas Costa was another couple of players mentioned. Leon Bailey's a name that was thrown left field at us by Fabrizio Romano on last word on Spurs. I don't know why Spurs need another winger, but apparently Spurs still want another winger, which which again makes me, I don't know, 
with Tottenham, it fascinates me. You've got so many wingers there. You've got Bergvine, you've got Lamella, you've got Mora. Uh, you've got, you know, Son plays there. I mean, how many more wingers can a club have? We don't seem to be linked with many centre-backs, though, Rick, do we? No, no, just the just the two at the moment, Diaz and obviously Kim Min Jae. I mean, as I mentioned, Scrimrar was one. Could it come back on the radar? I don't think at his current release clause. I mean, again, I look at other centre backs around the league. You know, it's it's you have to pay premium for a decent centre back in the Premier League. That's the reality. Absolutely. You know, I, you know, I think the player that Spurs really liked, really, really did like, and they just couldn't get near him once City got involved was Nathan Ake. Spurs had been following Ake for such a long time. And he was a player that they really, really liked because he could play that left cent- that left-sided centre-back role. And I think they were looking at him very, very closely when they knew Jan Vertonghen's legs were giving up on him. But the minute Man City showed their interest, I think Spurs bowed out. Ricky, thank you very much. I'll tell you what, it's like a, a phone call to you for a quick five minutes and then it turns out to be over an hour. So uh, thank you got. very much for your time tonight and uh, come on you Spurs. Come on you Spurs, come on you Spurs. Many thanks to Ricky Sachs for joining me on today's video, talking all about transfers. Please do follow him on Twitter. All of his details are below. And uh, please do put all of your thoughts and comments in the comments section below on everything that uh, Ricky and I spoke about on today's video. If you don't subscribe to the channel, please do hit that subscribe button. And I will see you soon for a Tottenham News video. Come on, you Spurs.